Hello, welcome to this week's lecture. I will be talking about the Atlantic system, that is the complex of economic and political ties between Europe, Africa, and the Americas that comes into being in the 1600s. But we're looking at the 1700s this week when that system is already in full swing. So this is the next step in this trajectory of the making of a modern capitalist world order. Because there are maps that I want to show you, I'm going to switch to my lecture slides at this point, and uh, you can follow along as I speak and look at the lecture slides. There are three parts to this Atlantic system that I want to separate. Trade is one thing, that is how things get shipped from one place to another. Slavery is the mode of production by which the goods that fuel the system are produced on plantations in the new world. And then finally, coffee houses, that's the distribution and consumption end of the system in Europe, the places where people go to buy these plantation goods. On the map, whoops, shut up. On this map here, you can see where Olauda Equiano, who is the author of this week's text that you're reading, traveled during his lifetime. It starts from Africa on the lower right hand corner, where he was born and taken into slavery. The dotted lines show his travels while he was a slave. And then the solid lines show where he went after he was a free man and sailed the Atlantic, hiring out as a, as a free black sailor. So what you see here is for a working class person, for a former slave like Equiano, um, it was entirely possible to see that much of the world to get around on that Atlantic because it was a busy place. It is the highway of world commerce, then as in fact still today. Never mind um, trade between North America and Asia, the North Atlantic really still is the busiest place for shipping uh, in the world. So Equiano is the person you're reading this week, but in order to make sense of slavery and what Europeans have to do with it and how that fits into the, whether, whether this is a side story or whether this is the main story, in the bigger picture where we're talking about the transition from a traditional order in Europe to a modern capitalist one. That is the question that this will help to answer. So the three different stages of this Atlantic system that I mentioned, it turns out are in fact differently far along on that progression from the traditional order to a capitalist order. The production system, of slave labor on plantations in the new world functions by a different logic than trade and transportation, this triangle trade that you might have heard mentioned between Europe, Africa, and America as three um, angles, I mean, three dots, ends of the triangle. <clears throat> and finally, the sales and marketing end all follow a different logic, all are to different extents tied into this story of the making of capitalism and modernity. So let's take this apart by looking at each stage individually. If you look at the new world, which is highlighted here in this reddish color, that is the heart of the plantation country. This is for the most part tropical climates where certain things grow very quickly. The goods that are being produced on the plantations, if you hear plantation, you might associate that with cotton. But cotton makes sense to grow only once you have a textile industry. Only then do you really have mass demand for cotton. Before the textile industry takes off, which is, it only just starts in England in the 1780s, and it doesn't jump the boundaries of England, onto the continent and into North America until the 18-teens, 
So until there is a textile industry, there is no mass demand for cotton. People make clothing and cloth and yarn from sheep's wool. So in the 18th century, the goods that are being produced, cotton plays virtually no role at all, are coffee, cocoa, tobacco, and sugar. And we'll revisit the significance of why these goods, why these substances, why these plants in a minute. The way they're organized, the way the production is organized is in uh, by forced labor. Africans, almost exclusively at this point, Africans, although there had been Native Americans and poor European whites who were also at least temporarily employed on plantations, but slavery is almost entirely a racialized system where Europeans force Africans to work for free, Africans who were abducted from their homelands in Africa, or once they live in the new world, inherit their unfree status from their parents. If you're born to a slave, you are born as a slave and you can't, you remain one for the rest of your life unless very special circumstances apply. And so the reason why the plantation economy is centered in these parts is because that's where that stuff grows cocoa, coffee, tobacco, and sugar. Um, unfree labor, where people are not free to leave, where they call the person in charge a master, and where agriculture is the main business, seems to be part of the traditional European order. And certainly the people who ran the plantations tried to sell it that way. Because after all, most people who work in manufacturing or agriculture in Europe at the time are not free to leave. They are still part of that traditional order. And guess what? They also obey a master, the master of the craft, the master of the land. So slavery in that sense seems to be a normal thing, of, a normal way of doing things. But of course, that if you look more closely is not entirely true. In fact, not at all true. Because in the European system, the unfreedom of the craftsman, the unfreedom of the peasant was not a one-way street. In slavery, it is. The master can sell the slave. In the traditional order, the master of the craft cannot sell his journeyman or apprentice, and the master of the manor, the lord, cannot, say, cannot sell the peasant. In fact, the higher-ups in the traditional system are just as unfree, just as bound to do right by the underlings as are the serfs, the peasants, the journeymen, and the apprentices. In the new world, that is completely different. And so the, um, the defining, one of the defining differences between slavery and traditional forms of unfree labor, like in the crafts, like in European agriculture, is precisely the, the lack of mutual obligation. The obligation is all one-sided. The slave must work. The master, if he is not satisfied, can sell the slave and, of course, can also sell the land. So this is a big difference and it foreshadows in the way that the welfare of the working person is no longer built into the system as a concern of the owner and main boss of the, uh, of the, of the business. It foreshadows the factory. It foreshadows capitalist ways of producing things. Likewise, in the way that when you have a slave plantation, you're not, unlike in the craft workshop, you're not concerned with building up the individual slave to become independently competent in doing what he does. In fact, the less independent and the less competent, the better. You don't want a slave to get any ideas about his, his worth and his qualification. So slaves are worked under the close supervision of a foreman of a man with a whip and possibly other weapons to keep them in line and to force them to work. 
they have to be forced to work because unlike in the uh, in the craft workshop in Europe, they don't have an incentive of their own other than the threat of death. They um, do not have any incentive to feel pride in their work. And of course, they don't get the benefits of their work in the end. All the profits, except for the bare minimum sustenance, goes to the master of the plantation. So here too is a, is a, main, is a major difference. In the traditional European economic order, the livelihood is the outcome for everybody who is involved. And while the journeymen and the apprentices don't get as much as a master, they're not entitled to quite as much, nonetheless, they get to have a decent living uh, at their station. The slave gets scraps. They don't get the meat from the pig. They get the knuckles and the sinews and so forth. They don't get the, uh, the good and healthy stuff. They get what's cheap and what's left over. So <clears throat> in spite of the formal similarity, the labor is unfree. The substance of the relation between the owner of the business and the people who work for him in slavery is, um, in that sense, no longer traditional. It is very much a modern thing, and it resembles and it foreshadows the factory. In many ways, when factories emerge in Europe and they take away the business from the craft workshop, they take over manufacturing from the crafts, with the, with the factory, the plantation comes back into Europe. The plantation comes home to roost, so to speak. So once people sit in long rows under the close supervision of often violent factory overseers in textile manufacturing and then later in other branches of industrialization, the method of organizing work is no longer that of the craft workshop with its leisure and collegiality and working alongside the boss. The method of work in the factory is that of the plantation. Is, is slavery um, having come home to Europe to enslave the whites, so to speak. Now, the trade, of course, manning those ships, the hundreds, the thousands of sailors that are required to get the goods to Europe, to get the slaves to the new world, is a system of labor all its own. And here, we find that the Atlantic system is still the most traditional. If you think of a ship, you might have an image of a very authoritarian, top-down workplace where the captain's word is everybody's command. And if you don't do as the captain says, then it goes off and you're off to the brig. But this view of shipping and of, of seafaring is very much a product of the 19th century when the hand of captains had been strengthened against their sailors already, where the ship owner is now fully in charge and can do as he pleases with the ship and to a large extent with the crew. In the 18th century, on the other hand, it's still a completely different picture. If you have a mental image of the craft workshop, if you can extend that onto the sea, the ship, in the way that the captain and the crew relate to each other, is far more like the relationship between the master of the craft and his journeymen and apprentices. The captain's authority is not absolute, it rests on his competence. If he is a good navigator, if he takes good care of the crew, people do as he says. But if he doesn't, if his commands put the ship or the crew in danger, it is not uncommon for the crew to lock him up for the duration, or if he shows up at the, um, at the helm uh, incapacitated, you know, drunk is a common thing, um, they lock him up and they take over because after all, on a ship, everybody has to know exactly what they're doing. So the pride in the work, the pride in the competence and skills of the sailors on a ship 
matches the pride in the workmanship and skill and competence of a craftsman in the workshop. Everybody, especially when it's a life-threatening situation, say in a storm, everybody has to know exactly what they're doing and how they're doing it. Everybody has to work together as a team or all the people on board might die. So if you're out there on um, a mast or off on the side of a sail in a storm, you can't wait for somebody to come along and tell you what to do. You have to know it right away and you have to do it well and seconds might count. So that pride in the work, that ethos, that competence establishes whether you're a good sailor. Um, that independent quick thinking is more important than obedience that disobedience that might self save the ship if you ignore an order by the captain because you simply know better what is the safe and best practice at that moment um, that marks a ship as a workplace that functions by the same ethos as the craft workshop it's collegial or co collegial i suppose and it's not merely a place where people get hired and paid and then are supposed to functions at, function as automatons. So the attitudes that you have on land, where people say, we have rights, there is a whole system of religious beliefs that goes with this line of work. All of that also applies to sailors. They have their own patron saints, they have their own more or less Christian um, beliefs. I mean, the, clearly the, the widespread belief in the little demon, mischievous demon that lives in the hull of a ship that you can't anger or else you might sink the ship is not exactly a Christian idea, but it is definitely part of that extended belief system that sailors bring. And although they get paid wages, and although they get hired under a contract, which are both markers of a modern um, capitalist labor relation, the moment they step on board of that ship, they have rights that go far beyond those of a free wage worker in a modern capitalist system. Part of what makes crews so strong in defending their uh, prerogatives and defending their rights is that the people who go to sea usually know each other. Another idea we have of seafaring out of the 19th century is this notion that sailors are uprooted, that they lounge around in bars until somebody comes along and drops down a bag of gold coins in front of them and says, come and join us for a voyage to Shanghai. Um, in reality, and this may be this may reflect realities in the 19th century when, when the role of the sailor has been changed to that of a wage worker. But in the 18th century, it is different. In many cases, a crew on a ship comes from the same village. They may be farmers uh, for part of the year, and then they hire out to augment their income to work on ships for another part of the year. And of course, that is usually the summer in between sowing and harvesting or just as likely they might be fishermen so they already have a connection to the sea also from the same village and when the fish that they catch are not in strong supply and of course the summer is also a time when you can't really preserve fish very well and so there is not much fishing to do you might instead go on merchant voyages and that also helps. The people who are on a ship are tight, are a close-knit group, not just because they know they have to rely on each other for their survival, but also in many cases because they know each other. And point is, if they don't already know each other, they will get to know each other pretty quickly. So keep that in mind. If you look at how Equiano interacts with the crew members on that ship where he finds himself, 